Welcome back to Sunless Skies. Last episode, we saved the Earnest Agitator, ran from the fire that follows, and came up with a plan that to truly escape the fire that follows. Hey, Scornfluke. I'm just going to ignore him. <laughs> um, to truly escape with the fire that follows, we need to leave the skies, which means going through the Avid Horizon, which means opening the Avid Horizon, which has been closed for a very long time. So last episode, we got some like plans and ideas from the Eagle Con. And now what I'm just about to do is head down to the Quiet Sea to try to build a base of operations here. Or maybe I need to go to the Avid Horizon itself. Yes, establish a base at the foot of the gate. Oh, only three supplies. That's not much. I'll stay at the base and get things underway. Will you gather anything else we'll need? The earnest agitator suggests. It takes several trips to row your supplies and materials over. The earnest agitator establishes a small camp between the clawed toes of one of the great cloaked statues that flank the gate. At least the fire that follows should find it more difficult to reach me here, surrounded by a sea, she says, hopefully. You tell her to be careful regardless. Take the necessary steps to open the Avid Horizon. Learn how to deal with the Watcher on the left and the Watcher on the right. Hmm. Seven casks of Devartine gemstones. For that, and seven immaculate souls. And two condemned experiments. Pretty costly, but I should have all of those things back in my bank. Back to the Avid Horizon. Ambition, visit your base at the gate. The earnest agitator is working there on an unhappy mix of ritual, invention, and machinery that you hope will open the gate back to the Neath, where the suns can't find you. Two vast, winged shapes, the Watchers, guard the Avid Horizon. From the Yoshi Collection. Maybe I should just call it Yoshi. From the Yoshi Collection, you've learned that the gate between them is law made substance. While the Watchers watch, the law is enforced and the gate remains closed. The Ernest Agitator has constructed a modest research camp here and is working on ways to suppress the Watcher's sight. We only need a moment, she says. One moment of distraction. Find a way to blind the Watcher on the left. Your friend frowns up at it from her papers and her calculations and her workbench. It is stubborn. It can't be reasoned with. It must be blinded. It is said that Navaratine gemstones are the sparks that fell from the Forge of Souls in those days when it thundered with new life. They adorn the mantles of suns. Earthly kings have gone to war to possess a single stone no harder material is known in all the sky. Together, you develop a process to crack them like eggs. When each one splits open, the spark that spills out is as bright and sharp as a needle in the eye. When you've perfected the process, the earnest agitator looks over at the horde of hewed stones that you've concealed beneath a tarpaulin. I'd better get to work. When it is time to act, she will be ready. Find a way to bribe the Watcher on the right. The earnest agitator has been studying it. It has begun to doubt its purpose. It wonders about other futures. In other words, it can be bribed. You speculate on the nature of the intelligence that is resident in the gargantuan winged statue. What might such a being want? A being that has stood unmoving and vigilant for millennia. The earnest agitator's theory is that it has served the suns. It wants what its masters had. The suns crave and collect souls for reasons of their own. Would the watcher know what to do with them? It doesn't matter. The wanting is enough. You assemble a collection of souls that would make a sun burn green with envy. Mm, let's see, there's multiple things to do. 
There's multiple ways to get through it, it looks like. This one, you need the burrower's attention, but not its wrath. Royal Dispensation. Once the Watcher served the King of Hours. The King is dead now, but perhaps a gift from another regent would be enough to divert their attention for the moment you need. Hmm. Well, let's do help your friend prepare her device. The Earnest Agitator has been constructing a machine that is half science and half speculation. It combines valves and pistons with sigils and secrets. The souls go into an alembic on one side of the device. The navarative sparks go into a casket on the other. Between them, a magic lantern projects kaleidoscopic sigils onto the door between the watchers. Sigils of forced parting, of denial and defiance, of unbidden passage. Where the sigils fall, the door gleams with frost. The earnest agitator looks haggard. She has taken to drinking a concoction of her own invention to help her focus on her present task and scatter her thoughts on other matters. Matters that might draw the fire that follows. Now her task is nearly complete. Only luck has kept the fire away so far. How long will it last? There's a problem, she says bleakly. All the Watcher's attention is set on the door. They have none to spare for us. For this, she kicks the device. Unless they attend to it, just for an instant, we can't bribe them and we can't blind them. You need something to attract the Watcher's attention. Okay, so that's the thing where I either need a Royal Dispensation or this, right? Yes. I've only gotten one Royal Dispensation in the entire game. So... I don't know how to get one. I imagine it's the sort of thing that you could eventually get if I was sided with London and working for the Ministry and stuff like that. That's probably something you could get. But is somebody working against London? No. So, the burrower below. How do I gain the burrower's attention? I have no idea. I need to do some research. I did some research on the Sunless Skies wiki on how to get the burrower's attention because there's three different statuses that you can be in with the gods. Either they don't care about you, or I don't think it's really they like you, but just that they're watching you, or they actively dislike you. So basically, don't care, watching you, hate you. And there's actually not a lot of things that will actually increase how much the burrower is looking at you, to the point of watching you but not hating you. Uh... Most things either reset your burrower status down to zero so it doesn't care about you. It's about, you know, appeasing an angry god. Or it just straight up makes it angry at you. But making it kind of interested in you but not hating you is actually kind of hard. Um, it seemed like the biggest and easiest way to get the burrower's attention deliberately is go to the Silent Saint and it looks like it worked. So remember, this is the place with the messenger below the ice. And I wasn't exactly sure what would get the burrower's attention, but I tried to use explosives to breach the ice. I failed, and that has made the burrower watch me. Not hate me, but watch me. So that should do it. Now we're ready to prepare an invocation to the burrower below. Legend has it that during the beginning of things, the burrower below dug tunnels through the sky. She retains the right to demand passage. If she spoke, the watchers would listen. The earnest agitator musters the last of her strength. Recently, she's sure she's seen blue fires dancing on the sea. Exhaustion? Or has the fire that follows found a way to reach her? You dab yourselves with woad of impossible colors. You sacrifice a fortune in hours, the burrower's preferred diet, to the waters. You perform scenes from the notorious play The Seventh Letter in which dragons feast. 
you're answered by a sound from below. Not from the quiet sea, but deeper still, from the very roots of the sky. A low, booming resonance, as if the vaults of heaven groaned under the weight of the stars. Your friend scrambles to her equipment and drags out a phonograph. She cranks its handle, and a needle records the sound on its foil-wrapped cylinder. The deep noise lasts only a few more seconds, but it's enough. The earnest agitator attaches the phonograph to her device. That's it. The song of the burrower. She tugs at the long glove she wears to conceal the secrets burned on her arms. We're ready to go. So this is the end. This will complete this captain's story. Travel beyond the avid horizon. The earnest agitator has constructed an elaborate mechanism, half science, half superstition, to open the way. Shall we knock? She asks. <laughs> okay. Well, let's do it. We're all going in, including Langley. Remember? We're their long lost love. They're coming with us. The sooner you return to the Neath, the sooner you will be beyond the reach of the fire that follows, and the courtesy, and the sun's secrets. Your friend activates her device. It emits a tone like the ring of a huge crystal bell. A shiver runs through the gate. You feel the watcher's attention shift from the gate to the device, passing over you like the stifling pressure of a storm front. There's an eruption of light. Seven possible colors and seven impossible ones. The Navaratine hues of the hollowed gemstones, the luminous sheens of your offering of souls. The gloom of the quiet sea is set ablaze. The door! The earnest agitator cries. You look. Its valves are turning. Its ice shatters. The doors shudder in part, just a sliver. A crack in the sky. And beyond it, a place of cool, comforting gloom. A cavern of improbable vastness. A subterranean sea. Settlements strewn like pearls along its water-lapped shores and lonely islands. A flock of bats rustling through the windless airs. A starless place. A secret place. The Neath. Home, the earnest agitator breathes. She takes her hand. You step through the door and from the sky into somewhere deep and dark and marvelous. Your legacy has gained an heirloom, a terrible secret. Claim your legacy. You donate your Blythe, Agravain class juggernaut, to your chosen successor. You hope they can handle it. Your fellow academics will ensure the next captain... Whoa, a lot of things are popping up. Your fellow academics will ensure the next captain in your lineage receives the benefit of some of the discoveries you made. Your bohemian friends are eager to meet your successor. They have gifts. You moved in villainous circles. They remember their debts. Your successor will benefit from their unspoken code of honor. After subtracting their fee, Hallage's bank arranges your successor's inheritance. You donate your, now slightly faded, chart. With your assistance, your successor will start out stronger and wiser than you did. Perhaps one day they will even surpass you. So the successor will receive the full ship, including all the stuff that was equipped in it. Some captivating treasures and searing enigmas and uh, crimson something, crimson secrets or something. And looks like they'll inherit about half my money, 8,000. And they'll start at level 20. <laughs> they'll start at the max level. That's funny. So, I consider what we just saw to be the canonical ending of my playthrough. It's the honest one, it's the one I first chose, it's the one I feel is most honest to Elizabeth as a character. However, I 
did figure that I probably would want to explore the other big ending, which is killing a son and sacrificing the earnest agitator. So I made a copy of the save right before I made this choice. That's what I just loaded now. And let's explore the non-canonical ending. I'm just curious how it's all going to go down, you know? Sacrifice the earnest agitator to the courtesy. It's too late for her. She knows so much the fire will always find her. But her sacrifice will summon the courtesy and allow you to bargain. The fire pounces and the earnest agitator is engulfed. The last of her secrets bloom across her skin. The petting, gnawing wrongs of her youth. The extent of her feelings towards you. The fact that, in the moments before she dies, she regrets making this bargain and wishes desperately that the fire had taken you instead of her. Their second mouth speaks words in the language of suns. Its tongue is a yellow flame, its voice is deep as a brass bell. The fire that follows has burned a sigil on the city, and from the sigil arises a logos of the courtesy, a servant of the judgments, a word of living flame. It pulls the soul from the earnest agitator and brands you with it. A livid sigil is seared onto your, into your skin, closing your second mouth forever. It symbolizes your admission to the courtesy, a license to kill a son. The smoke swirls, the fire fades, you're alone on the rooftop. You must find a way to kill a son. You can begin at New Winchester. You are now protected from the fire that follows. You have bargained with the courtesy for the right to kill a son, whether through luck, oversight, or some cosmic loophole, they assented. Now you need to work out how to do it. Find an ally of sufficient magnitude. Your investigations taught you that only beings capable of killing a son are other sons or entities of a comparable stature. You're going to need an ally. You look for the things that sons fear, the things they forbid, the things they imprison. Incarcerated in the White Well, on the edge of the Blue Kingdom, is a being with cause to hate the sons. Perhaps you could forge an alliance. Ooh. <laughs> Form an alliance with the thing in the White Well. Oh, that sounds dangerous, because that thing has been so unbelievably creepy. All that we've experienced of it. Well, I'll see you in the Blue Kingdom. Ambition, descend into the well to form an alliance with, with the thing interred within. The sons feared it and imprisoned it here. Perhaps you and it can help each other. With harness, batons, and pittance, I'm not sure what that is, and a carefully secured rope, you climb down the ice of the well's mouth and into the dark which seethes and scuttles and surges up from below, and the darkness is spiders, thousands of spiders. Not common spiders, but sorrow spiders, each the size of a cat, and the leg of one is knotted to the leg of the next. A living, tidal tapestry of them, gushing across the icy walls. A voice reaches up from below, and you realize that this seething flood is only a digit, only a finger, of the incomprehensible mass of them trapped deeper in the well. Sorrow spiders were a plague on old London due to their custom of stealing eyeballs to lay their young in. <laughs> no! Sometimes they would become knotted into a spider council, but no council you ever heard of comprised more than 40 or so. The thing in the well is billions. A spider senate. Its voice is soft. And who is this? A creature of ambition. A creature of imagination. A creature prepared to do what others would not. Let's use one of my, one of my crimson promises to propose an alliance. You intend to kill a son, perhaps that would interest the Spider Senate. The Spider Senate does not laugh. Yes, yes, I would be interested. I've had a long time to think about it. I cannot leave the well, but my legacy could. You could carry it for me. 
You have come this far, of course you agree. The spiders surge across you. There is an unpleasantness concerning your left eye as it's opened and hollowed and an infant sorrow spider lay gently inside. Uh... We will need a web to span the stars, the spider senate says, as the deed is done. Establish spider councils in Eleutheria and the domains of the king of ours and the territories and the territories of the garden king. They will be our first strands. We're embarking upon a great work, a work of centuries. Despite the savage pain and occasional stirring in your eye, you linger in the well for hours, laying your plans with the spider senate. When you emerge from the well, your path is set. Okay, range of spider council in the Reach, Albion, and Eleutheria. Probably going to the hub of each of those areas, I would assume. Well, let's head back to the Reach and do it there first. Turns out the Spider Council actually isn't established at the main ports in each of these places, but you have two to choose from for each region. For the Reach, it's either Port Prosper or Lustrum. I think I prefer to do Lustrum, but I don't know if it actually makes a difference where you do it, uh, like story-wise. But convenience-wise, Port Prosper is definitely better because then it's just right next to the pathway, the relay to Albion. Okay, so how do I do the thing? Probably explore Port Prosper? Yes. Establish a spider council. Your sorrow spider has outgrown your eyeball now, of course, which is only a useless husk. I hate it. You watch your spider scuttle across the shingles, looking for chimneys or drain pipes near open windows. You spend a week in Port Prosper. You're surprised by the lack of headlines reading Mysterious Plague of Stolen Eyes and the like. Apparently, the Windward Company keeps a close rein on the local newspaper and does not like panic. Before you leave, you visit an attic draped with veils of cobwebs and spend a night knitting the legs of infant sorrow spiders together to form a spider council. It's so creepy. I hate it. So I guess the question is, who do I want to hurt? Basically, because what it did is I lost fortune with the stovepipes because I brought this plague of eyeballs stealing spiders. <laughs> so yeah, don't do it at a place that I like. So actually, it's a good thing I didn't go to Lustrum. Attend the grand ball. Gossip with the servants. I kid you not. I did something with like the servants. I think it was the servants here at Port Prosper just a little while ago. And they gave me 16 pots of nostalgia crockery. I had to space like four of them. 16! For Albion, we can either do Brabazon Workworld or Perdurance. I prefer Perdurance, I, I think. But I'm going to do Brabazon just for convenience because it's right here at the relay. And I don't actually know, like, I hope it doesn't hurt the workers. I hope the spiders go for <laughs> the rich assholes here. The managers and I forgot exactly what their names were, but the company people. I hope it goes for them and not the workers. Your sorrow spider is cunning and will be able to find its way down to the work world. You release it, and sure enough, watch it scuttle silently after an overseer as he passes through the gates. Yes, go for the overseers. Time moves more quickly in the work world itself, so barely a day has passed for you when the spider reappears, its work already done. In the wordless, signed language of its weaving legs, it informs you of a forgotten factory, now clogged with webs, where the juvenile sorrow spiders have learned to knit themselves together using an old spinning jenny. Nice. Strength of the sun remains unchanged at zero. That means the strength of the sun would have went down if it could have. In Eleutheria, we can make the spider council either at the Eagle's Empyrean or what was the other one? 
Mm, Langley Hall is the other one. I wanted to do Eagles Empyrean because it's right next to the relay back to the reach. Now I'm just trying to figure out where exactly I do it. I don't do it in London's Enclave. No. I, well, have I visited the embassy? Yeah, I don't do it that way. Be spectacled official? No. Visa checkpoint? Ah, here's where I do it. The streets of the Empyrean are well lit. Your spider will need to be careful. You watch your spider scurry into the hard neon shadows with some trepidation. You feel a connection with it. You did, after all, carry it in the now useless husk of your left eye when it was young. You needn't have worried. It returns a week later, having located a secret spider cult in the recesses of the city. They call themselves the Motherlings. Are expert in the knitting of spider councils and are fully supportive of your endeavor. <laughs> awesome. So, what now? That's all of them. Doesn't say what to do next. I guess I probably just go back to the White Well and talk to it again, right? Hmm, I just took the transit relay back to the Reach and then it just popped up with this. So I guess you just have to wait for a little bit of time to pass. A Tangled Web. You've established spider councils in the Reach, Eleutheria, and Albion. In time, they will multiply and grow and found further spider councils in other ports. They will be the spider senate's eyes and the instruments of its will. At the heart of each council is a sorrow spider imbued with a precise set of instructions from the senate. They have much to do. Proceed with the next part of the plan. This is only the beginning. Your scheme will be centuries in the hatching although your own role is most vital in these early stages. Oh. Yeah, they weren't kidding about... making a web to cover the stars. It's gonna be centuries, wow. In addition to their duties as your eyes and agents, the spider councils have begun work concocting a remarkable venom. Each council will contribute one element to the compound. It will be a generational work of noxious alchemy, a symphony of poisons. But for now, you must make for the Blue Kingdom and the Toll Tower at Low Barnet to make deals with devils. Because every trap requires bait. Deals with devils. I wonder if those are um, devils that are related to what the repentant devil was talking about before, about researching what sons eat. Maybe those devils are ones that are responsible for or know what a son would like to eat. Just arrived at Sky Barnet. Ambition, the heart of the web. Your scheme with the Spider Senate necessitates a base of operations. Oh no. No. I need an indulgence. Remember how many trips it took me and I had to wait two weeks in between and it takes a moment of inspiration. Okay. Okay, uh, forget that for a second. Let's read this. <laughs> What's more, the lower levels of the Toll Tower are occupied by devils, and the next parts of your plan will require their expertise on matters of time and of the soul. Commission the invention of a unique soul. Devils are professionals in the assessment, refinement, and sophistication of souls. As payment, they require a staggering number of immaculate souls and an indulgence of the westernmost king himself. Well, the 10 things of Immaculate Souls, not a problem. I've got 19. The Indulgence, that's a problem. Uh, not Journal. Where do I see how many uh, things I have? Possessions? Moment of Inspiration, I have one. 
Well, you'll have to do. I'll uh, see you over at the son's daughter. Here goes. Oh, wow. 20% chance and I rolled high. Nice. Okay. Back to Sky Barnet. Let's commission the invention of a unique soul. It will take generations to prepare a suitable soul. A matter of nature, nurture, heritage, circumstances, character, history, environment, stellar exposure, and other rarefied considerations. The devil in charge of the work is very excited. You've commissioned a shining, intricate soul. A soul to catch the eye of a sun. Death's door should hurry to open for it. Trumpets should sound. The sun will take the soul for itself. And then the spider council's venom. But you're getting ahead of yourself. First, you'll need a base of operations to suit you for the next two or three hundred years. You should purchase quarters here at the Toll Tower. I'm going to live that long? Am I? Requires a crimson promise. Secure a long-term lease to a chamber of the Toll Tower. Your requirements are precise and include a provision that you will only be disturbed on three exact dates spread over the next three centuries. The devils do not require payment in coin, of course. Promises are more precious. I will only be disturbed on three exact dates over three centuries. What? That, am I just going to be in solitary confinement? For three centuries? You claim a chamber nestled in the tower's foundations. You'll be comfortable enough and has room for your possessions. The hour loom and the enormous trove of hours you will require to see your scheme to fruition. Ah, yeah, so I am using hours. In fact, it's time to turn your attention to the latter. Soon you must cloister yourself from the world until you are required. You'll need a modified hour loom and more time than you have ever seen to construct a gallery of eons. Contribute hours to your store of time. You'll need a very great number of them. So what do I need that I'm missing? I need years of accumulated time 300. <laughs> Need a thousand sovereigns, that's nothing. Three otherworldly artifacts, nothing. Condemned experiment, that's easy. But uh, yeah, contributing hours, how many do I need? Your gallery of eons will need to sustain you for three centuries, give or take. The hour loom alone won't be enough. However, Devil's relationship with time is casual at best. As part of your lease agreement, the infernal residents of the Toll Tower have agreed to extend the benefits of that relationship to you, ensuring that each barrel of hours fed into the loom lasts even longer. Even accounting for their assistance, though, you're going to need a staggering amount of hours. This is such a... this is already seeming like such a sad end. I mean, it was sad the moment we sacrificed our best friend in the world, the earnest agitator. But then add to that the fact that, I mean, by the time I come out of here, everybody that I've known for the most part is going to be dead, right? Obviously, the centuries, the three centuries aren't really passing for me. Otherwise, I would die. I'm a human. But they must be passing for other people. Right? So like everybody would be dead, everything as I know it will have changed in three centuries? I imagine so. So then, whoa, we're just going to wake up three centuries later? Our best friend, dead? Best friend has been dead for centuries? I don't know, it feels hollow. Like, can you imagine how depressing and just 
isolated and alienated you would feel? Just waiting and coming back out even? Refine ten barrels of hours with a searing enigma. Forge hours into weeks with a word of fire. You will gain three times the usual benefit from these hours. Ooh. Ten barrels of unseasoned hours. Perform an experimental technique on five barrels of hours. Perhaps there's a way to keep the moment filaments from tangling. This will triple the time you receive. If you fail, you'll still get time and a half. Ooh. 92% chance of success? Yeah, this is the way to go. This will double the benefit. If you succeed, you will automatically get the best result 10 years from a single barrel of time. And I need 300 years, so at the absolute best, it's going to take 30 things of hours. Is that right? This actually might not be too bad with the experimental technique. Alright, let's see how much I have for now. Twenty-six. Whoop. I don't actually need to clear up my inventory till it all fits since I'm not leaving, but I don't know, it feels bad, you know. Experimental technique. So how many hours is that going to give us? 99 years. Wow, this is going to be pretty easy, actually. Your process is successful. Lesser minds would call it magic. Years spun from nothing. Oh, it requires a condemned experiment. I didn't realize that. I don't actually have that many of that. I do have a lot of searing enigmas, though. Let's do this one. 222 years? Well, there we go. That's it. You've accumulated the hours you need. A trove of them. A dragon horde. A mountain of hours for a handful of centuries. Construct a gallery of eons. To see your plans come to fruition, you must excuse yourself from the usual, usual passage of time. You will need... Cutting-edge research, a thousand sovereigns for an hour loom, otherworldly artifacts to modify it, and about 300 years of accumulated time. You have the time loom constructed in a room adjacent to your chambers. Powered by the eerie properties of the otherworldly artifacts, it rattles and thrums, spinning a tight fold of time over the room. You can feel the hours pressing about you, thick as cotton wool. You've ensured your time here will be comfortable. There are well-provisioned bookshelves, a cozy fireplace, an armchair you could lose yourself in, a phonograph for when you're feeling modern, and an infernally chic... Chase? Is it pronounced Chase? Lounge? Uh, that's not lounge. Long? Chase Long? I don't know what that is. For when you're feeling... Loosh? <laughs> Everything is ready, are you? This will conclude this captain's story and end the game. I think I need to take a sip of my coffee first. Alright. It's time to kill a son. You dismiss your officers and crew. They can't follow where you're going. You give your engine to the first person that catches your eye at the station. A likely-looking sort with the star gleam in their eye. The devils of the Toll Tower gather, curiously, to bid you a revoir? Probably not pronouncing that right. See you in 70 years, one of them says. His tone is offhand, but you can practically hear the curiosity gnawing at him. You give him an enigmatic smile and close the door behind you. Time passes oddly in your gallery of hours. The loom thrums in the next room. 
The hours are taut and thin like a bubble straining to pop. You read, you pace, you think. Outside the decades pour by. Seventy years pass. There's a knock at the door. An eyeless priest stands outside. Wordlessly, he hands you a copper box. The mother poison. You take it and close the door. Inside the box is a glass file. It contains the elaborate poison a dozen spider councils have labored over for the last 70 years. It's so rarefy it's not liquid or vapor. It is a thought, scintillant and shivering behind the glass. Unstoppering the file, you pour the venom notion into a silver teapot. The copper box was padded with newspaper to protect its contents. Curious, you unfold and flatten it. An article about recurring Albion-wide blackouts following the Great Malfunction. Speculation that the Parliament of the Reach is debating a declaration of war. An account of the arrival of the wintry ambassadors of a distant white star, seeking an accord with London. <laughs> News from the last three centuries. Well, actually, no, not last three centuries, just 70 years. You return to your waiting. You've read all your books now. You've listened to your handful of phonograph cylinders. You consider learning the oboa, which you bought in a fit of optimism when furnishing the gallery. Outside, thirty more years hurry by. There's a second knock at the door. Admit your guests. It is the presiding deviless of Carillon, accompanied by a demure shade with a brass-trimmed death mask. The Devil-S sits primly on the edge of your chase lounge, or chase lo I don't know. <laughs> I think you will find everything to your satisfaction. I would describe this shade's soul as irresistible. Not fortifying, but fascinating. Exhilarating, even. The equivalent of Turkish delight, perhaps, rather than steak. You smile at the shade and reach for the silver teapot. Tea? The mother poison does not affect it at all as it drinks. The Shade's mind cannot perceive or conceive the venom thought. That is as intended. The Shade is not the victim, but the vector. Hmm. So it's... the thought is... They can't taste the thought, but the thought, the poison thought, is inside the Shade, and I assume they're going to go through Death's Door and attempt to be eaten? Examine the shade. The shade's naked soul is not visible, of course, nor would its virtues be apparent to you if it was. But you note its additional eyelids, arrayed one behind the other, and only visible when it blinks in a distressing cascade. You note the many-jointed grace of its movements and the marble-smooth skin of its hands, without follicle or fingerprint. When it has consumed the venom, you stand and bid your guests good day. They depart, and you return to your waiting. More of the pulled tight time of the gallery passes, in which you take up the aboa, break the aboa over your knee in frustration, learn to repair the aboas, and master the aboa. A calamitous century thunders by beyond. I hope I'm pronouncing oboa right. Then a note is pushed under your door. Read the letter. The handwriting is so improbably neat it could only be the work of a devil. It says simply, The shade has passed beyond death's door. And that's it. You've moved each piece to its proper place. The rest of the work passes to someone, something, else. Time is all you have left. There's no way to distract yourself now. You can only wait and fret and hope. This is the worst part of scheming. When you are reliant on other parties, invisible to you, doing their work. But eventually, the time loom clatters its last. Your hours are spent. Another century or more has haunted the world outside, and it's time to claim your prize. Leave your chamber of hours. You push open the door to your gallery of eons, 
you climb the brass banistered stair. You emerge and look up at the broken ruin of the Blue Kingdom. The cobwebbed throne. Above, a web of incomprehensible vastness stretches across a quarter of all the sky. Its strands are hung from star to star, smothering their light in jackets of strangling cobweb. The sun of the Blue Kingdom is a twitching, riven husk. You can see where the mother poison planted a seed deep within it, where the spiders grew and multiplied, feasting on its innards and its innermost secrets. When its skin split open, and a new spider senate spilled into the sky. The spider senate stirs in the recesses of the web. The strands dance. The captive stars quiver, helpless as flies. Welcome, spinner of the all web, sub regent in the empire of silk, friend. A million spiders spin a soaring bridge and you cross it to the gargantuan cobweb throne of the westernmost king. You sit, a tiny fleck upon its seat. Its authority is yours to wield. What will your royal name be now you are regent? And you answer, I will have no name. The first and only act you will take as regent will be to cast open the doors to your realm. A throne of your own. The old laws need not stand. Let the walls between life and death be torn down. In your domain, the dead will be free to return to their life, and the living free to depart. All will be welcome, and all will be free. The sons will be horrified. The spider senate seethes in glee. That is a very satisfying ending. It's more satisfying than the other one, but also so it's kind of horrifying and just kind of sad. It just kind of makes me feel sad. Like, I don't know how hours work. Maybe the crew and all my old officers are alive, but I can't help but think that they aren't and that almost everybody I knew except, you know, the devils and other people that live for an incredibly long time. Can't help but think all the other ones are dead and coming out into this blue kingdom I don't recognize with almost nobody I knew still alive. Our best friend in the world was sacrificed three centuries ago. It's a sad ending. It's really sad the more I think about it. Well, finally stuck it to the stars, huh? Well, everyone, that is the end of my Sunless Skies playthrough. I don't really know how to cap off the series. There's something about just the longer a series goes on, the more momentous it feels, the more weight and inertia it feels like it has. And it feels odd that it's over. I'm not going to make another episode because it's been going on for so long. For the curious, my time played in Steam is 159 hours. This is, I think, by far the longest single player game I've ever played, and certainly by far the longest series on my channel. I adore this game. And man, I love Fail Better games. They're the developer behind this, if you didn't know. I loved Sunless Sea so much, and I was sad that I didn't finish it, but I just lost so much momentum when it came to a sudden end, which if you're not aware, when I played Sunless Sea, I got a very good amount into it, but definitely still a good amount away from the end. Like, I don't know, maybe I was halfway through it, and basically a bug ended up killing me, 
I mean, like, a bug in the software, not like literally a bug attacked my ship. It ended up killing me, and that game had permadeath at the time. And the whole lineage system thing was going to pass on almost nothing to my successor. So I pretty much lost all of my progress after like, I don't know, 60 hours or something. I mean, heck, let me actually bring up Steam and see how many hours I put into Sunless Sea. Sunless Sea, uh, yeah, I put 61 hours into it. So, you know, sudden permadeath at the hand of a bug after 61 hours, it just lost all momentum and I was like, damn it. I was enjoying it so much, but it really just killed the mood. But despite that, I still loved that game, and this game is everything I liked about that, and better. Fail Better writes some damn pretty words. <laughs> I remember being so impressed with the writing in Sunless Sea, and it's the same in Sunless Skies. It's brilliant. It's so just evocative and beautiful, and so many of the sentences. Like, you remember earlier on in the playthrough? how quite a few sentences I came across were just so satisfying to say. Like, they were just beautiful sentences that I just said them multiple times just because it was pleasurable to read them. Like, when does that ever happen in a game? It's so brilliantly written. So I don't know what Fail Better's plans are for this game. I don't know if they're planning on making any sort of DLC or anything like that. They did make one DLC for Sunless Sea, the Zub, I think it was the Zub Mariner expansion. Basically like a underwater exploration kind of thing that they added to it. If they do something like that for this game, but then I'll likely pick it up again, unless it involves lots of repetition. I don't know, it just depends on what they do and how they implement it into the game. You know, if I would have to basically play the entire game again to experience some new stuff, then maybe not. But, yeah, we'll see. I, I hope they make more and add more to this, and of course I hope they make more games in this series or at least like it. I'm also strongly considering replaying the first Sunless Sea for a couple reasons. One is that I never actually finished that game properly. Again, I got 61 hours into it, which was probably about halfway. So there's a lot of stuff I just didn't see and didn't get to experience because of that. And also, there's the entire DLC expansion pack, the Submariner thing that wasn't available at the time that I played. So that's entirely new. Bunch of brand new stuff for that. Plus, Fail Better tends to add updates um, separate from DLCs or anything like that that add quite a bit of new content. I mean, just look at this game since since the beginning, and I started playing it right about when it came out, to now the end, they've released two major updates. Like, they redesigned all of Albion and added a bunch of kind of small to medium-sized things, and then in the newest update, they added a new, uh, a new officer. Yeah, they tend to add a lot of stuff separate from DLCs, and I suppose they probably did the same thing for Sunless Sea. I also played that game around the time it came out, so my experience of it was fairly early on. So there's probably new content and stuff just from, uh, just from general updates, too. I know one of the things they did, by the way, <laughs> was they updated the version of Unity that they were using for Sunless Sea, and they overhauled their whole UI system to be customizable with customizable like font size and things like that. So you can scale the GUI up and down. Maybe that doesn't sound like much, but go back and watch my first episode of Sunless Sea. The text was so small. It was honestly that entire game. It was actually hard for me to read the text. I had to be really close to my monitor and kind of like squint at the text. It was like just on the verge of readable. So that's actually going to make a pretty huge quality of life difference too. All right. Well, that is the end of Sunless Skies. So thank you so much for joining me on this journey through the skies with Elizabeth. <laughs>